areas or uh, the subject uh, areas which we teach to the master students. And this is one of the topic which is not, uh, you know, very common to the science people, especially when it comes to the presentation. But he wanted me to talk on research methodologies. I have made a presentation for the PhD student, and some of the part will be for uh, useful for uh, you know the faculty members as well. Uh, with this uh, brief note, uh, let me just uh, go what research is. In common parlance, the research means search for knowledge, and in the advanced learner dictionary of current English, it is defined as a careful investigation or inquiry, especially through search of new facts in any branch of uh, knowledge. In the Redman and Ab Mori, in their book, uh, Romance of Research 1935, they defined research as a systematized effort to gain new knowledge. And in the scientific way of uh, you know, the research is the study conducted for the purpose of contributing towards science by the systematic collection, interpretation, and evaluation of data that's to the planned manner is called a scientific research. So when you are doing a research, you must know the importance of doing it. So if you opt for a PhD as a career, it's important to know research methodology and research method. One must have a band of mind of the thing with a quest to discover something new. And you must know the logic behind the research. Knowledge of research methodology helps to understand the objectivity of research. So there are two terminologies actually. One is research method, another is research method, how they differ to each other. When we talk about the research methods, it means we are talking about those methods and techniques that we are going to use to conduct our research. So research method or techniques thus refers the methods the researcher use to conduct the research. Whereas research methodology means the way to conduct the study in a systematic way. So it may be understood as a science of studying how research is done scientifically. Research methods do constitute the part of research methodology and the scope of research methodology is wider than the research methods. Research methodology not only talk about the research methods, but it also consider the logic behind the methods used in the particular study. It also explain the particular method or a technique used and why other methods are not used. So the research results are capable of being evaluated either by researchers himself or by others. So the key component of research methodologies are number one, objective. So objective, when we talk about the objective of the research, objective are the reasons for doing the research and expected outcome. And the objective are the why of research. So when you do the research, you need to have an objective. And objective is nothing, but there must be a question mark why, why you want to do that. And they should be clear and coincide. You must be precise, not to leave any room for enormous interpretation of result. Let me give you one small example of the why importance of why in research. And I think most of you may be from chemistry background and you must have heard about the famous reaction called Heck reaction. You know, Heck reaction is nothing but the carbon-carbon bond formation uh, utilizing palladium as a catalyst. And if you look at the literature, the palladium was discovered way back in 1802. And the discoverer of palladium was Walston, and who died in 1827, 25 years later of his discovery. And by the time he died, 90% of palladium he extracted was remained unused because have, there was no application. Next 150 years, the palladium application was not much around. The first catalytic application of palladium was uh, discovered 
and that is uh, for the uh, you know uh, the uh, what it is called walker process and walker process is nothing but the conversion of acidity into acetaldehyde and that was the first catalytic application of palladium and today uh, more than 50% carbon carbon bond formation reaction are carried out by utilizing palladium as a catalyst around same time uh, richard hay after completing phd joined a private industry uh, for a job and his boss allowed him to work uh, some other areas of his own interest and he started working on cobalt carbonyl compound way back in 1950s and he could publish very good papers on cobalt uh, cobalt metal complexes carbonyl compounds but uh, there was no uh, application in terms of you know revenue or the economics and in the same floor where he was working there was another scientist who was working named Pat Heller and he was investigating the mechanistic aspect of Walker process that is the conversion of acetyl into acetaldehyde and one day he made a presentation scientific presentation in which Heck was one of the audience and Henry while making his presentation made a uh, postulate of the mechanism how the mechanism might be going through but please remember 1950s the carbon metal bond was not that famous so he, the mechanism what he proposed the henry proposed concluded that the metal carbon bond is so weak so it cannot be isolated and decomposes and it gives you the product heck sitting over there as an audience thought something else put a question mark in that he thought that carbon metal bond is stable but the mechanism is came back to his laboratory to test this hypothesis he used the, uh, mercury acetate and aryl halides and palladium to as a catalyst did the reaction you could generate styrene the very minor and that discovery making of carbon carbon bond using palladium as a catalyst was the first example discovered by him in the 1971, Richard Heck published seven Jacks papers in single issue, one after another. If you look at those issues, it is just line by seven papers. And in 2010, he got the Nobel Prize for his discovery. And this is what the importance of why in research. Uh, the next component is the experiment and the data collection. Experiment and data collection covers the logistic of the research. It determines how the experiments should be conducted and data should be collected. If there are multiple data collection source, the methodology should be described each describe each source and how they fit together to make a bigger picture. Explain the pro and cons of each data collection source. The survey make a distinct connection between every question and the research objective whatever research objective you have whatever questions you have there must be some kind of correlation between you. don't ask questions that don't link directly to the research objective finally reporting the paper writing explain how you plan to share the information to the scientific community judge your own work in terms of what is already known and what advancement your research will bring to the existing literature. This is what we need to do. So in nutshell, the flow chart, when we talk, what is the research process? The first one is the research problem you need to define. Then go for the review concept and theory and review the literature. Formulate the hypothesis, design the research plan, collect the data, maybe the experiments, and analyze the data and come back and interpret and write the research papers. This is the overall uh, plan of the research methodology. The first and foremost important thing is the literature. Literature search constitute a very important part in research methodology. The literature search gives you the idea it familiarize you about the extent of knowledge available in that particular field. It also gives you an idea what are the gaps, 
if there is a gap, how can you fill up these gaps by your scientific way of doing it? And at the end, you generate a new knowledge. Let me uh, go back and tell you about the importance of literature search. And that's to what we people always don't uh, keep in mind, the ancient literature. Uh, most of the time, whenever we talk about the scientific uh, literature, it, it goes back 1920 or something like that, because after World War II, there was not a one, there was not a problem. So most of the scientific literature, the documented literature, exists about 1900 years. But what about the ancient literature? I will give you one example of that, how much important the ancient literature is. Uh, th that is the discovery of Artemis was discovered by uh, two Yu Yu and China in 1967 started a national uh, program exploring the natural products and more than 2000 natural products were explored and one of the extract from Artemis annual showed a promising degree of inhibition against parasite growth that is called malaria unfortunately that was not reproducible. The result was not so, so in science, when you do something, if this is not reproducible, it has no meaning at all. So when uh, uh, she looked at the ancient literature, uh, there was a book called Ji Hong's Handbook of Prescription of Emergencies that was published way back in 1574 AD. But what it talks, it talks a handful of wing out immersed with two liters of water, bring out the juice and drink it all. And this is what it is written in this line over here. So Queen Kuba, this year, do you took a clue from this statement, she thought it is possible that we need to go for cold extraction because in the, the extraction, what she was doing at that time was the hot extraction. So to take a clue from this literature, she did the cold extraction. When the cold extraction was done, the results were produced. And that led to the discovery of one of the wonderful drug molecules, what we call artemisin, that is used for the treatment of infection caused by, by plasmodium falciparum. Here is the uh, 2UU, and she got a Nobel Prize in, 19, in 2015 in medicine. In medicine for her discovery for this molecule that we call the Artemis. Another important example I will give you, uh, the discovery of penicillin. Look at here, whenever we talk about penicillin, we look at the textbooks also. You ask the general knowledge question, ask the question that who discovered the penicillin. Straightforward answer is Alexander Fleming. How many of us know what is the truth behind it? In 1928, we all know how that was discovered. It was the excellent discovery. In 1928, Alexander Fleming found the leftover petridis, which contains the uh, Staphylococcus uh, S. aureus uh, bacterium, for a week. When he came back, saw there was a mold around it, and around that mold, the bacteria lies. And he wrote a paper. In 1929, in the British Journal of Experimental Biology, what he said, he said the penicillin has antibacterial potential. But remember, after that, it did not publish a single paper on this particular area. He left this one because for him, it was not reproducible. Not reproducible means the yield of penicillin. Penicillin was too low, so he could not even characterize it. The structure was given by Abraham, so Nobel Prize when we come for that. So 1942, Dorothy Hodgkin gave the structure by X-ray or the Nobel Prize. And Singh gave the synthesis, gave the synthesis, and this is the structure. Nine years later, this paper published by Fleming, British Journal of Experimental Pathology, was read by Harvard Thorin. And he got interested in them. He, Thore and his employee chain started working on the penicillin. And the yield was as usual. And there was one person called Albert 
Alexander. He was a police cop uh, in uh, London, and he had the uh, S or yes infection on his face. The infection was severe, so severe that one of his eye has to be removed. Since their laboratory was next to the hospital, they visited the hospital and talked with the family and the doctors. They have some penicillin. So if people are interested, they can use this penicillin to treat the infection of Alexander, Albert Alexander. Since there was no drug and death was certain after that, so he, they were allowed to use this molecule or penicillin for the treatment of bacterial infection. It worked. It worked. His infection got cured. Unfortunately, the dose was low. It relapsed. Ultimately, he died. Then the fourth person called Norman Hatelecki in picture. He was the person who developed a factory for the production, mass production of antibiotics, that is penicillin. But Sore once said that the project, what he started was initially was uh, driven for scientific interest and medicinal discovery was just a bonus. So he was more interested on the science, not the application part. But you, as you know, the history now tells how important the discovery of penicillin was in the uh, area of medicinal chemistry. So what happened? Then during uh, World War I to World War II, the death rate dropped to 1% from 18% from World War I uh, due to the bacterial infection. And it was Norman Hatley who increased the yield of penicillin by 1,000 times. Now, what happened? You don't remember Hatley's name. Somewhere we write name of uh, you know, a chain and uh, so mostly penicillin means Alexander Fanny. And this is where the problem is. We as a teacher, we as a scientist, we don't read the literature holistically. Whenever you teach anything to the students, go beyond the textbook. See original history of that particular discovery. Try to bring out those people who make much more contribution than they are visible. They are not visible anymore. So, in terms of uh, words of great Oxford professor Sir Henry Harris, what he said, without Fleming, no chain or so. Without Thore, no Hetley. Without Hetley, no penicillin. This is what the contribution of Hetley was. But three people got them. Fleming, Thore, and Chain. Fleming got 180 awards and had honors. Hatley contribution was not even recognized for another 45 years. So when I looked at the literature and all that, I was not sure why Hatley was uh, left behind from the Nobel Prize. Maybe the Nobel Prize cannot be given more than three people, that may be the reason. But literature also forward. forward. The literature also nobody talks about Hatley. So these are the three people who got the Nobel Prize for the discovery of penicillin. And at the end, after 45 years, in 1990, he was awarded an unusual distinction of an honorary doctorate of medicine from Oxford University, the first given to a non-medical person in Oxford 800 year history. Hatley got only two awards. There is no name of Hatley in the textbooks. That's important. OK, when we talk about we always talk about good research. What makes good research? Good research means good science. So when we talk about good science, good problem selection, smart objective, proper methodologies, and proper analysis. This is good research. Or good science. Is this so? No. This along with good ethics constitute a good research. If your science is good, the ethics are wrong. It's not good science. In fact, it's not a science. So first and foremost thing is the ethics in science. So this is what one should remember. The PhD student must remember. So when we talk about ethics, 
explains the truth, whole truth, nothing but truth. The truth means be honest on your mission. Whole truth means omission of a part of research funding might cause the research misconduct. Remember, whenever you do a research in the lab, many things we don't do. That is not the honest way of doing it. That may not be useful for you, but this is what you got. So whatever you got should reflect your, your research. Providing wrong information can be a bigger problem for you in the retraction. So all PhD students must understand what retraction means. Retraction is one of the biggest shame for a scientist. If your paper gets rejected because of wrong information, wrong data, or anything like that, unethical means, or will, the biggest dot on the face of the scientist. Let me give you one example. How paper the smallest problem can lead to bigger problem for you. The paper claimed the paper was in the medical journal in 1990 last year. That was written. What was the rejection? What was the reason of rejection? The paper claimed the ethical app. Approval was obtained through the University of Stellenbosch Research Ethics Committee. All the data was anonymized, encrypted, and stored securely on a hospital server. Okay, this so whenever you work in the area of the medicinal chemistry or the animal models, you need to have animal studies means ethical approval is must. Ethical approval is must. So the author wrote it that the ethical approval was obtained from this university. All the data is of the captain. What rejection would say? This paper is being rejected at the request of editor in chief due to the author's negligence in assigning proper institute ethics reviews, assigning country of origin making claims concerning the use of data which could not be substantiated. What is it? What happened? This author, who, who, who is a very well known in their field, by the way, went to this university for uh, some time, did all the research work there, ethical approval was obtained there, came back to his own institution, wrote the paper, now gave his corresponding author's address to the parent organization, not to the side. Now, this is what the editor in felt that it is not correct because the data is not obtained from them. People got it. Why people become unethical is the reason behind it. It's a professional pressure, the idea of publish or perish, the tenure track or retaining a job, keeping up with the peers, securing grounds, being forced to discover. This is submission requires published paper. MPCS student and supervisor or ignorant supervisor. Yes, the supervisor is very hard, difficult to change the feelings. PhD student will understand that what it what does it mean all these increases forces to be shorter or miss revenues or worse for the phd student remember no matter how tough is your time don't buckle under pressure don't give any wrong data if you do that, you may be able to teach your supervisor today. Tomorrow, it can lead a bigger, bigger problem for you after your supervisor. And so, when we talk about research ethics, ethics, it's honesty, honestly report the data, results, methods, and procedures. 
डोंट फेब्रिकेट फॉल्सिफाई और मिस इंटरप्रिटेट ऑब्जेक्टिविटी स्ट्राइव टू अवॉइड बाइस इन द एक्सपेरिमेंटल डिजाइन डेटा एनालिसिस डेटा इंटरप्रिटेशन कीप योर प्रोमिसेस एंड एग्रीमेंट एक्ट सिंश्योरिटी स्ट्राइव फॉर कंसिस्टेंसी ऑफ थॉट एंड एक्शन रिस्पॉन्सिबल मॉनिटरिंग इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट इन रिश्वत एज एंटर यू शुड हेल्प टू एजुकेट मैंटर एडवाइज द स्टूडेंट प्रमोट देयर वेलफेयर एंड अलाउ दम टू मेक देयर ओन डिस्ट्रिक्ट ट्रू रिफ्लेक्शन ऑफ एक्सपेरिमेंटल डेटा फाइंडिंग मस्ट बी इन द रोल ऑफ सुपर वॉर्स टू गाइड mentor students in such a way that they can learn about systematic processes of discovery what makes a graduate student a success prepare for on slot of failure persistent determination ability to clearly articulate ideas if you have these three qualities in you you become a successful graduate but remember it's all honest you know when you are doing masters just remember when you are given a small experiment how many of you reported your experimental results correctly to their teachers not many my experience working at delhi university is that more than 90% 95% of students report to you Don't. They don't check the melting point, but they tell you the melting point. So anyone who has this kind of training, the day you join the PhD lab, must leave that kind of habit out. Then into the lab. Once you enter the lab, bigger or smaller thing, it's just honesty. Remember that. Unfaithful recording of the data can cost you your PhD. I'll give you the example. Jean Perrault was a supervisor and Peter Nagy is different in friends. There are two papers published in the Journal of Biological Chemistry were rejected and that appeared in May 13, 2020. The corresponding author, means the supervisor, identified a major issue and flaws in the data analysis to data fabrication on the part of one of the students. Now, what the supervisor writes? The supervisor writes. This nightmare period, therefore, lasted almost four years. After completing the PhD, the student went to Sweden for postdoc. He was doing a postdoc there, during which the supervisor tried to get answers from the student about the reasons and motivations for such a misconduct, with no success because the student didn't respond to it. Today. my greatest regret is not having an answer as to the motivation of this student this is what supervisor writes but as a this supervisor this will never take away a certain feeling of guilt so the mistake was done by a student who is the sufferer sufferer is everybody everybody not only the supervisor the whole group so be honest with you so when it comes after you complete your experiment and all that it comes to the paper what albert einstein said says if if you cannot explain it simply you don't understand it well enough is as simple as that it means when you write a paper you should understand first of all so what you wrote if you can't follow it properly that clearly indicates you don't understand your field the mit professor professor kelly immanuel said what is such a very important before writing a major paper i make a point to read papers or books by authors whose writing style i have a high regard for this can be anything from classical fiction scientific papers written during the victorian period etc i find that 
this can temporarily influence my own writing and erase, this is important, and erase unfortunate memory of numerous dry, badly written papers. One inevitably has to read as a background to the research one is presenting. So, how many of you do that? How many papers you read before going to write a paper? This is important. Another one, Peter Thorer was an editor in chief of a journal called Carbon, which has more than eight impact factor, ACS journal, for more than 12 years. He said he had eight reasons of rejection of paper. For those, researcher over work does not fall under the scope and aim of the journal. You don't see it and you submit the paper. Unclear writing, fragmented sentences, missing concept, no connectivity. No research funding. There is no research funding at the end. Poor writing, general guidelines is not followed. Lack of evidence, small, simple size. You don't have enough data to prove what you are doing. Wrong research method is the methodology what you have applied. It's not reproducible, does not sync with the literature. Poor analysis, inappropriate techniques used, which does not support the outcome. Ethics violation, negligence, copyright violation, improper citation, authorship issues. His advice was. By avoiding these pitfalls, you will save reviewers, editors, and staff time and frustration. This is important. Remember that when you submit your paper, the editor should not get frustrated. If you get frustrated with paper, you will not send for the review process. And ensure that your work is judged by a scientific merit, not mistake. Remember, editor is not there to find for the review. That you must know. As an associate editor of uh, Royal Society Advances and Nature Scientific Report, my observations are never hide if your paper is rejected only. Honest disclosure about the source. Most of the time, let us suppose if you submit a paper in Tamcom, it gets rejected. And tomorrow you submit another uh, Royal Society journal. And there is a column whether you have submitted this paper earlier or not. Most of the time, most of the people, what they do, they just say no. Okay? Don't do that. As I said, research is all honesty. If you do that, it means you are dishonest. And as an editor, I have a privilege to look out the previous history of your all submission. So I can see whether this paper was submitted earlier to Royal Society of Journals or not, number one. If submitted, what was the reason of rejection? I will have that. And what you did after this, I will have that. So if you don't disclose that, then editor will conclude that it was not honest. You will return that. So disclose it. Huge number of submissions by a single author in a particular society journal. That's another unique object in what I got. You won't believe some of the authors, especially from China. I saw about 100 submissions in a year in Royal Society different journals. That I also can see. And that was also based on it. Too much of self citation without any relevance. Don't do that. No citation of previous work in the field that gives an impression that the work you did the first time. Too many authors' work, work is not interdisciplinary. You see that. Many times what happens, you have 10 authors, but it is just a catalytic work, a limited number, maybe 30 compounds, 10 authors, doesn't make any sense. Incomplete characterization. Data presented in the experimental section does not match with the SI fields. Don't do that. So all these becomes the part of rejection before even your paper being, being sent to Delhi and my Pre-skin rate was 40%. So 40% paper I reject based on these criteria. And this is what it is. When you want to reject without rejection, there is a column here. Pre-skin, no novelty or impact. This template comes automatically. After careful evaluation of the manuscript, I request to inform blah blah blah. You all know that. Okay.
and it gets rejected. So it's not like that editor's decisions is always honest. Editors can make a mistake. Let me show you a few historical mistakes some of the biggest German editors made. The paper got rejected, the person got a Nobel Prize on the same paper. The first one is a foreign. The work was on weak interaction, rejected by nature, too far from reality was the common. He got a Nobel Prize in 1938 at the age of 37. Krebs paper on citric acid cycle, 1937. Nature, though, accepted it, they did not reject it. But they said, we have a backlog. You have to wait for a long time. So since the wait is for a longer time, we are returning back your paper so that you can think to publish it somewhere else. Where this somewhere else? Instead of nature, he published in this journal. 53, he got a note by university. And this is the uh, nature's comment on Krebs paper. Next one was Moregel and Men's work on classifying the elementary particle, 1953. The title of paper was Isotopic Spin and Curious Particle. A very interesting. Physical Review rejected this paper because the editor did not like the word curious. They suggested you write unstable part. Now, author didn't like it. Paper got rejected. Got Nobel Prize in 69. First model on Higgs, 1964. This paper was also rejected. It was the rejection. It did not warrant rapid publication. 2013 Nobel Prize in Physics. Another one is Richard Ernst for the discovery of three dimensional magnetic resonance spectroscopy. This was rejected twice by general physical chemical physics. Then, Finally, he could publish it in Review of Scientific Instrument in the Nobel Prize 1991, the same work. So it is not only the authors and reviewers make a uh, student make a mistake, editor also make a mistake. History is full of such examples. So when it comes to paper writing, paper writing starts, uh, starts from uh, abstract writing. It should be very concise and informative in production. It should cover what did you others do, why you do it, methods, how you do it, results, what did you get, discussion, what does all it means, conclusion must support the logic as well. This should be the flow of your paper, we all know that, but the PhD student should remember all those points when you write your paper. So the first thing is the abstract writing. So abstract tells the prospective readers what you did and what is the importance of which. Together with the title, it is the advertisement of your article. Make it interesting and easy to understand. Without reading the whole article, one can get the whole story. Avoid using jargon, sabdzal, bade bade uncommon abbreviations and references must be accurate using the word that convey the precise meaning of your research. The abstract provides a short description of the purpose of your paper. It gives key results without experimental details. A clear abstract will strongly influence whether or not your work is further considered. So abstract is the is the most important in your paper. You write a graphical abstract make it very you know, informative and interesting. There is one other uh, uh, picture very recently it came where the Hindu god of God was with the you know, arrows uh, or these ladies. And this was the Angiwanta uh, paper in 2001. Next one is the introduction. This is the opportunity to convince the reader that you are clearly know why work is useful. A good introduction should answer the following question. What is the problem to be solved? 
are there any existing solutions what is the best what is the main limitation what do you hope to achieve in the, in, the, in the introduction section you must be able to answer all these questions and it is like to see that if your work fits in the aim of the journal you must cite a couple of original and important work including recent review articles don't make introduction section a history lesson long long introduction puts readers off the introduction must be organized from global perspectives to enthralling need of the work to the objective one writing it. state the purpose of the work research activities adopted also the question but do not mix introduction with results discussion and conclusion always keep them as a separate entity in your essay hypothesis and objective must be clearly remarked at the end of the book expression such as novel first time first ever paradigm changes changing are not preferred use them very rarely one hit one then write the description it is the easiest section to write but hardest section to get right okay so this is because it is the most important section and there here you get a chance to sell your data the number huge numbers of manuscripts are rejected because of the discussion is free keep the following tips in mind avoid statements that go beyond the results and certain avoid unspecific expression what we do high compression low rate highly significant don't use those words. avoid sudden introduction of new terms and ideas in the discussion section speculation on possible interpretations are allowed but these should be rooted in facts rather than imagination in chemistry we propose a mechanism so you don't isolate all those intermediates what you propose right but whatever you propose should have some scientific backing on that and this is most important which most of us ignore is that reference editors hate improper and irrelevant citations such act of author gives an impression that author has no sense of what many times paper is introduction is concluded with a line that in contribution to our work okay and then cites and if you look at the citation those cited papers has nothing to do with the paper what you have or should do there are survey in ecology journal and the finding was very interesting what was that finding 22% citation were inaccurate okay in 22% of the articles the citation was there. another 15% unfairly gave credit to review authors or other citations so what happens whenever you cite a paper you just look at the recent review article cite you cite the review article but who has done that work for what was that first paper that paper must be cited along with the recent review article not the vice versa you cite the recent review article in which the author has no contribution there are review articles you know you know that there are review article published in which the paper has no contribution the author submit don't do that. write a good conclusion reviewers and reader will find it difficult to judge your work if you don't do that common error in this section repeating the abstract or just listing the extent of results trivial statements you should provide a clear cut scientific justification of your work in this section and can provide a future direction of the work also so once you have completed your writing of your paper you must be very very clear about plagiarism and this is 
very very important the plebeian word is derived from a latin word called plegri means kidnap in the merriam webster dictionary it defines as well as to steal and pass off the ideas or words from another to someone else it is probably the most common form of scientific dishonesty found in the research articles and collins dictionary which explain that plagiarism is the practice of using someone else work and pretending that it's his own work. okay so this is very important when you write your paper type of plagiarism can be different so you can some can use the idea of someone else and present it as his own idea copying of a portion of a text from one source to another source without giving a credit that can be because of the lack of knowledge mosaic plagiarism means the patchwork plagiarism that happens when we don't find good words to you know write our own papers because most of the non speaking english countries have this problem so we use Uh, cut and paste from somewhere and try to change that uh, cut and paste and during that we forget that we have not changed many things self help plagiarism is not welcome it can also lead a problem and for that all the phd student must read the ugc rules passed in september 2017 what it says the students may have to submit the revised paper if found plagiarized within 10 to 40% within 6 months time if the plagiarism is 40 to 60% student cannot submit the paper next one year and if it is more than 60% the uh, the phd registration will be cancelled for the teachers 10 to 40% you can withdraw the paper 40 to 60% your annual increment will be stopped more than 60% plagiarism You can face the suspension and dispensal from the service. This is really, really important. So when you go through all this, read it, you'll be more clear. So you have done the literature source, you have done the uh, paper writing. While paper writing, you have uh, looked at the clauses for the plagiarism. Now, where to submit? Your 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 institute is a bigger institute, good institute. You don't publishing. any sub standard journals but there are many institutions universities colleges smaller places where they intend for publication only they don't look at whether the journal is good or not and good or bad journals is nothing but nowadays it is defined as you know uh, this uh, sorry let me just give you uh, two examples of very bad form of plagiarism uh, this is the paper published in 2002 international theoretical physics and this was in nuclear physics in 1982 so if you compare this paragraph to this paragraph word to word same and there are many papers from this author these authors were caught finally the person was removed as a vice chancellor he has that has caused a job this problem this kind of problem can lead you to this way of retraction don't do that and this is one of the very peculiar kind of retraction i'm not uh, telling the name here you can see in this paper came from 2020 uh, raman research institute in bangalore they published a paper in chemical, chemical communication in 2017 and it was you know, retracted and one of the author the senior author was in the editorial board of many journals and was most cited in chemical combination 2006 and 2007 apparently what happened one of the paper from said came for a review to this author okay and they rejected it when the paper was rejected he submitted to somewhere else got published in between these authors wrote on the paper around same findings publishing them okay and when it was caught now there was an inquiry committee from pemco in that inquiry committee the author because he got retired 
he could not give a documentary evidence that the work which is published by the Nintendo in 2017 was done before he got paper from them for him. There was no report. So what does it mean? It means whatever you do in your lab must record properly what should be allowed. And that cost them the paper and the paper was retracted in March 2020. Publication where predatory journals, there is no definition, so no defense. Predatory journal by definition, it is called a journal or publishers that entities uh, prioritize the self-interest at the expense of scholarship and are characterized by the false or misleading information, deviation from the best editorial and publication practices, lack of transparency, and or the use of aggressive and indiscriminate solicitation practices. The term predatory publisher was coined by Jeffrey Dale in Nature for 2012. Hundreds of scholarly articles, including 38 research papers, have been written warning about them. Scientific societies and publishers have helped to establish think, check, and submit campaign to guide authors, but it is not enough. Still, these kind of journals are mushrooming everywhere. But what are the UGC rules on that? UGC has passed stricter rules now in 2019. What it say? Any publication in predatory dubious journals, presentation in predatory and dubious conferences should not be considered for academic credit for selection, confirmation, promotion, performance, promotions, appraisal, award of scholarship, award of degree, and credit. Anything. Not only that. Said vice chancellor, selection committees, research supervisors, guides, such other persons involved in academic evaluation and assessment are hereby advised that they must ensure that their decisions are primarily based on the quality of the research work, not merely the number. So remember that. So this is what I wanted to talk to you people about uh, the research methodology, what you should be careful about. I hope I was able to convey message to you people. Uh, very lately, I have uh, been involved in uh, developing YouTube lectures, especially on spectroscopy, and uh, developed a very good uh, uh, tutorial on mass spectrometry. And some of the examples are all of these uh, spectroscopic YouTube tutorials, whatever I have developed. Uh, you will find, if you look at it, you will find that uh, most of the examples what I have covered in those lectures are not from any of the textbooks available to you. A very unique kind of examples of cover. I advise all of the PhD students, the master's students, must watch these videos and subscribe because if you subscribe, future upload, you will get automatic update. One lecture I will be given next week to Amity University again on Anbar Spectroscopy. That will also be uploaded in the YouTube. So subscribe to these channels. You will, it will be useful for you people. Very informative lectures these are. Uh, this, uh, we work on medicinal chemistry and nanocatalysis. And uh, uh, lately, we have started working on nanocatalysis, and many of these papers were highlighted by Synfet, and some of the papers uh, came in the cover page of the journals. And one of the molecules that we developed for Parkinson has uh, cleared the preclinical trial. Now it is moving to clinical trials in the United States. And with this, let me just show you uh, who are my ancestors in the uh, academic field. Uh, I did PhD with uh, Dr. D.S. Bhapani from CDRI Lucknow. Dr. Bhapani did PhD with Derek Barton, Barton with Hellborn, Hellborn with Hunt. I could go way down Berzelius, then Benjamin Kerner. I did a postdoc with Richard Kiss from Purdy. Gibbs did uh, PhD with Ukamara, Ukamara with Kurtz, Kurtz with Gold, with Novel Lore, then Norris, Norris, Samson, I think, yes, Bola. And look at it here. This is the UK side, this is the US side. The last person is same 
that is Benjamin Thornton, 1751. I did a postdoc from Indiana University at uh, Indiana University of Jeff Kelsky. I could trace out his lineage up to 1637. With this, uh, I thank you uh, for uh, your patience hearing. Though most of the time, you know, we are used to uh, deliver a talk with a large number of gathering. In, in our university, we have 90 students in a class. So most of the time we have in the class, maybe 100, 120 students sitting and you are talking to the students. And by looking at the reaction of the students, you know, you can understand whether you are talking being followed or not. And you can change accordingly. But unfortunately, in this uh, way of uh, uh, lecturing to, to the audience, it's very difficult, it's not PG task. Because there is nobody in front and you are just talking. You are talking to whom nobody knows, right? So it, it's a difficult way of uh, uh, doing things. But since the kind of problem in the world everyone is facing, and this is one of the ways academic people can be